Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of coming before you. We pray, Lord, that you help every one of us to realize that you are the best to choose for us in our lives. Who are we to have our way? You, the Lord, must choose for us. And therefore, Lord, we pray that we will see and accept your wisdom and accept whatever you choose for us in Jesus' name. We pray that as we look into this word now, you will help everyone of our brethren who have not got married, that they will totally yield and surrender in your hand so that your choice will be acceptable to them, your will will be embraced by them in Jesus' name. We pray for those of us who have got married that will rejoice in your will in our lives in Jesus' name. Help us as preachers and teachers of the word to make your word so clear that those who are looking up to you to discover your will in marriage will be able to discover that will and live by that will. Guide us in your word now. In Jesus' name we pray. The session we have now is on scriptural foundations for Christian marriage. As preachers of the gospel, as pastors in the church of the living God, as teachers committed to the word of God, we cannot afford to be quiet on the area of marriage because it is a common issue as well as a pressing issue. People will want to get married and those who are Christians will want to be directed in the way of God as to how they should do it to please God so that their Christian lives will not be affected in any negative way. And so you will be called upon to preach on this subject from time to time. Not only that, you'll be called upon to counsel on this area regularly. In your counseling, you will need to direct those who are ignorant. You will need to re-inform those who feel they are well informed, but when it comes to the practical issues and the practical areas, they really do not know how to apply the truth they have got into their lives. You'll need to teach and instruct the people that have been led astray to some erroneous kinds of ways on this subject. And if you are really going to help the people of God, this is an area you cannot afford to be ignorant. Scriptural foundations for Christian marriage. Christian marriage can only be as strong as the foundations of that marriage has been. If the foundation is weak, the marriage eventually and the family will be weak. If the people that are getting married just hurried over it and it was a rushed kind of thing without going deep on a solid rock, you'll find that when the winds blow and the rain descends and the vicissitudes of life come against that marriage or family, it may be so shaky that things can fall apart. So then, it's very important because of our calling, because of our concern, and because of our commitment to preach the whole counsel of God that we will study, we will understand what the scripture has to say. 
single brothers and sisters who are of age in our congregations are generally anxious to learn what they should do in choosing a life partner. If, as we see the eagerness to learn, we do not teach them and instruct them in the way of the Lord, the tendency is for them to be looking for books, looking for materials. A lot of these materials may look interesting to them, but they can actually lead them astray. It is important, therefore, that we seek to know the truth about it, and we seek to preach and emphasize the truth concerning Christian marriage. It's important for those who are planning to get married and who are looking up to God that they want to see the will of God, discover the will of God, that first, instead of just seeking to get married, you seek God. You seek the kingdom of God and you seek his righteousness because only then do you have assurance that all other things, including marriage, will be added unto you. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 32 and 33. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Jesus had been taking time in this section of the Sermon on the Mount to tell the disciples and to tell members of the family of God the great danger in worry and anxiety. And he picked up the necessary things, the normal things, the natural things that many people are seeking for. It talks about food, it talks about treatment. It talks about necessities of life. And it said, we should not worry. We should not take thought. We should not be over anxious concerning these things. It says, for after all these things, do the Gentiles seek. The market is full of literature proposing or propounding answers to the questions in the minds of men and women. Because there is a lot of anxiety on getting married, you will see that a lot of literature is concentrated on that area. It is their worry, the anxiety, that has created market for these people that are writing. And a lot of the writing is not good. But then it says, we who are members of the family of God, we who are children of God, and we have our Heavenly Father planning for us, thinking about us, and what is important to us is important to Him, that we should not be worried. We should not be so anxious like the Gentiles. All the things they are running after, we shouldn't run after them. It says, for your Heavenly Father knows. Oh yes, He knows. He knows that ye have need of all these things. All the things you will ever need. The Father has taken thought about it, has planned concerning it, and at the right time, in the right place, He will bring these things out. He knows your need. He knows your desires. He knows what will really make your life to be fulfilled. That you have need of all these things. It says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God. Here is Christ who knows the heart and the mind of the Father. And it says, if you really want to get the heart of the Father, if you really want to get all these things you are looking for, if you want to get it before the anxious people of the world get it, if you want to get it before the carnal believers, those who are paying lip service to a Father in heaven, before they get it, if you want to get these necessities, basic necessities, before the prayerless carnal people, before they get it, 
if you want to get these things before the people that are running at breakneck speed, thinking that the faster they run, the earlier they will get what they are looking for. If you want to get it before them, you seek God. Seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then, just where you are, at the right time, all these things shall be added unto you. All these things shall be added unto you. I'm sure that you know that Jesus used his words deliberately. He chose those words. He said all. And all means everything. And if Jesus said all, marriage could not be something that God will overlook. All these things shall be added unto you. It is important, therefore, to be totally committed to the Lord. For only then are we on sure ground to discover the perfect will of God. Often, young people treat God like a rubber stamp. They come to him with their plans completed, made, and decided. And they ask him to stamp it, to bless it. There are some things that God cannot bless. There are some things that just will not go in line with the will of God, with the plan of God. And because we are so short-sighted, because we only have these eyes that cannot see beyond the wall, and because we are so limited in our understanding of what lies behind the curtain, there are some things that may appear good unto us, appear acceptable unto us. But when you take it to the Father, he really cannot bless it. And so, for young people, we we'll need to counsel them. We we'll do that lovingly. Because marriage is such a sensitive thing. And it is good that these young people are taught so that they already take a biblical decision before they become emotionally involved. You see, when somebody has become so emotionally involved with a person or with a thing, when you come to preach at that time, the emotion stands in the way. The kind of love which is not real but superficial stands in the way. But if before they ever get into that net, before they ever get into that difficulty, before they ever get emotionally involved, they know the truth. Then they know they're going to go to God first before they can ever make the choice. What we should do is not that we bring our plans to God after we have taken the decision. After the decisions have been made, we should pray to know God's plan before taking any decision at all. That is the basic commitment of the believer. That before you will say, I love this, I love that, I think that will be good, I think I'll give consideration to this, I think I'll give consideration to that, pray first. Don't think about anyone. Don't plan on anyone. Make sure that you pray to know the plan of God before any decision is taken. God has a plan for your whole life. Not just for your marriage, for your whole life. You see, we as human beings, when we are hungry, we think only about food. When we are thirsty, we think only about water. When we are going to, you young people, when you are going to have examination, your brain, your mind is not big enough to think about too many things. You only think about exam. When you are going to travel, if you are going to travel to a place you really want to get to, you see your mind is not big enough. A few days to that time, all that is upon you is just that place I'm traveling to. But you see, God's mind is very big. And therefore, God looks at you, and it, if you are hungry, he doesn't only really think about the food you are going to eat. He thinks about the food you are going to eat. He thinks about your life. thinks about everything. And then he fixes that food in such a way that it doesn't contradict all the other good things he wants to do in your life. The same thing with marriage. You think about if you are really hard-pressed. 
you're already getting emotionally involved. And you feel that the only thing I must do now is to get married. Otherwise, I don't know what else will happen. You see, your mind is focused just on that thing. And that is the way the human nature and the body works. But then when you get to that position, you realize that because of your limitation, you are thinking of just this one thing. But God is thinking about a lot of things he wants to do for you. And marriage is just one of those things. And it's going to pick the person you ought to get married, attach that person to you in such a way that that marriage will not contradict all the other plans, will not spoil, will not destroy all the other plans he has for your life. He has a plan for your whole life. And this plan includes your body, your soul, and your spirit. It includes your career and your marriage, your spiritual life and your physical life, your present and your future, your future on earth and your future beyond the grave. So, as we lay that foundation that to seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness, believing God, standing by faith, that all these things, as He said, will be surely added unto you. Then you look at some scriptures so that these scriptures will guide you. And as these scriptures guide you, you already make a commitment to the Lord, I will not do anything except as I'm taught in the word of God. We're going to look at some of those scriptures. If you, are, if you don't have any attachment with anybody as at now, it will be easy for you to look at these scriptures and say, praise the Lord, that this is the word that I ought to follow. If you have been thinking about an individual, but you really have not taken any step, and you are going to look at all these scriptures, you are going to have to do something for your own sake, for the sake of the kingdom of God, for the sake of the glory of God, to release God's hands, to be free to walk in your life. You are going to have to say, Lord, I've not taken this step really, but I've been thinking in this direction. But now I come before your word. And it may so be that what my mind has been thinking about, what my brain has been passing across to my heart, and what I've been telling myself, it may so be that it will contradict your word, if that is so, before I even hear the word at all. I take my stand with the word of God. It may be that you think you have prayed and you think you have known the will of God. If that truly is the will of God, all of us leaders, pastors and preachers here will be joining you in faith, saying, Amen, so let it be. But if it so happens that you think you have the will of God, and as we look at the revelation of the word of God, you see that actually that is not the will of God. That it has been the will of man. And it has been what you think you wanted because of now. And because you are short-sighted, we'll also be willing to pray with you. We'll also be willing to help you if you are willing to say that this is a scripture. Already you have attached yourself to something which is not totally and fully, completely the will of God. And we can help you in a way so that as we pray with you, as we counsel you, as we help you, you'll be able to say, Lord, I give it all. And if already you know the will of God, and it is the will of God, you know, sometimes we may even know the will of God, and this thing is the real will of God. But sometimes, what we begin in the spirit, we end up in the flesh. Because you see, marriage is such a delicate thing that it's like a beautiful flower. And while that flower is there, before you get interested in that flower, it is fresh. By the time you get interested in that flower, you are going to think, I'm going to take this flower home with me. And by the time you pluck it up, you've destroyed it. It's only as when it's there, it's good. Before you touch it, 
before you rough handle it. Before you do anything with it, it is fresh, it is good. Because before you got there, it was attached to the soil. And therefore, it could have everything it could have. Before you knew that will to that brother, to that sister, there was that attachment between that person and the Lord. And so the beauty of holiness, everything was there. And unfortunately, by the time you say, I know the will of God, well, be careful. Let that person still be rooted and attached to the Lord. You pluck that flower out. It just takes about a few minutes or a few hours or a few days, just about a week. What was beautiful before you knew it is turned withered and dry. I hope you don't do that to the will of God. We're going to talk about three points. Number one, problems of the wrong choice. The problem of the wrong choice. Number two, steps towards the right choice. Steps towards the right choice. Number three, courtship, engagement, and wedding. Courtship, engagement, and wedding. Number one, problems of the right choice. Why do we have problems? in making the right choice, especially in marriage. Well, the Bible tells us why we have the problems we have. And sometimes some of these problems you may not be able to completely avoid, except by prayer, by the word of God, by consecration, and by determination that you will not deviate from the will of God. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 31, verse 30. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Sometimes, beauty and the fear of the Lord don't go together. Very occasionally, occasionally, you may find beauty as well as righteousness and godliness lodging in the same place. But most of the time, you may discover that beauty and godliness, they don't lodge in the same apartment. And you see, we don't always see godliness. When you see a person at the first time, and a person is approaching you. What do you see first? It is beauty or ugliness that comes in front. And the godliness or the ungodliness is coming from behind. Therefore, because of what you see, the first impression, which is the physical attraction, which is the beauty or the handsomeness, that is what unfortunately appeals. But then it says, favor is deceitful. And beauty is vain. You see favor there. Favor means a lot of things. Giving a helping hand. Giving a gift. Showing mercy. You see, if a young man who has not got married begins to show mercy directly without using any method at all, he just says, sisters, I see you need this and gives. Next week again, sister, I see you need this and gives. That favor is going to be very deceptive. It's going to be working in the mind of that individual. Even though that individual may be very, very spiritual. Don't you remember that Isaac is a son of promise. And you know that Isaac was a consecrated person. Because when his father was taking him to be sacrificed, he said, where is, the, where is the lamb for the sacrifice? My son, the Lord will provide. And then when they got there, the father laid the wood down and then said, boy, I see, come nearer here. He came near, he began to tie him. And that young man did not cry, did not, did not resist or revolt, just surrendered himself. That man was a spiritual man. But he loved Esau. 
because of the venison that he ate. And Esau wasn't the one that was to get the promise of Abraham. But Isaac loved him, spiritual man. The son, the child of promise. Favor is deceitful. You young man, as you begin to give things and give things, you may say, I have a good intention. I don't mean anything. That thing you are giving is going to stand as a stumbling block in the future for you because already you are going to be affecting the heart of that individual. The same thing, you sisters, you need to understand this. That if I see could make a mistake, because of this favor, because of the venison, because of what you had been eating, you too you can make a mistake. That is why as a sister that is a real child of God, a young man gives you something. Oh, you say, I appreciate that, brother. But I wouldn't like to take that. I appreciate your love. I appreciate your mercy. I appreciate that provision. I appreciate the Christian grace in you. To want to give me that, but it may affect my mind. Maybe I'm not as strong as other people because it may affect me. It might even make me to be negative towards you. The devil might you see to mean in my heart that maybe you are trying to do something which you don't have in mind. Therefore, that's the reason I don't want to take it. You are avoiding making that sin a stumbling block to yourself. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain. Now, we cannot penalize people that are beautiful. It's not their fault. That's the handiwork of God. But we realize that good things like that, a good face, a beautiful face, sometimes can be very, very deceptive. And when we, when we read that, of course, this is talking about a woman. It even says it there, but a woman that fears the Lord, she shall be praised. But the problem is not only on the side of the women. The problem is on the side of men. Let's look at Second Samuel, chapter 14. Second Samuel, chapter 14, from verse 25. But in all Israel, there was none to be so much praised as Absalom for his beauty. Here is a man. From the sole of his foot, even to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. In all Israel, Absalom, handsome man, his heir, if you read the whole text, is uh, the way he will stand. Everything commanded respect and appreciation. But look a few verses later and see verse 29. Therefore, Absalom sent to, to Joab for Joab to have, to have sent him to the king. But he would not come to him. And when he sent again the second time, he would not come. Therefore, he said unto his servant, See, Job's field is near mine. And he asked, Barley field there, barley there. Go and set it on fire. And Absalom's servants set the field on fire. You see the temper? Hot temper. You see the life? Anger. You see what he did here? He sent for Joab. And Joab didn't come. He sent the second time. And Job had not come. He called his servants, this handsome man, called for his servants and said, go and burn his field with fire. Well, if he could do that to Job's field, what can he do to you if he gets married to you? You need to think about that. And these are some of the problems that people have in wanting to get married. What we should do is to make sure that we do not allow physical things to hinder us. And we do not look at the beauty, we do not look at anything physical. Neither do we look at the property that they have. Because these things can actually be very, very misleading. Judges chapter 21, from verse 19. Then they said, Behold, there is a feast of the Lord in Shiloh, yearly, in a place which is on the north side of Bethel. 
on the east side of the highway that goeth up from Bethel to Shechem, and on the south, Lop Lebona. Therefore, they commanded the children of Benjamin, saying, Go and lie in wait in the vineyard, and see, and behold, if the daughters of Shiloh come out in, to dance in dances, then come ye out of the vineyards, and catch you every man his wife of the daughters of Shiloh, and go to the land of Benjamin. And it shall be, when their fathers or their brethren come unto us to complain, that we will say unto them, be favorable unto them for our sakes, because we reserve not to each man his wife in the war. For ye did not give unto them at this time that ye shall be guilty. Here you find a kind of arrangement. It was deliberate. And these, would you imagine, were the children of Israel. But you, you need to understand that at this time, according to this chapter, look at verse 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. There are churches where there is no counseling on marriage. All those young people, boys and girls, they do what is right in their own eyes. They want to get married at the age of 14, they go ahead. No law, no rule, no regulation. If they want to get married at the age of 18, they go ahead. Their pastors don't say anything to them. Their pastors don't teach them anything about it. There's no law, there's no regulation, there's no rule. Everyone does what is right in his own eyes. And if they want to see somebody today, and the very following week already get to the registry and get married without any courtship at all, there's no regulation. Everyone does what is right in his own eyes because there was no king. But where there is a Bible-based pastor, it will be different. Where there is somebody that knows the word of God and knows it is his responsibility to watch over the congregation that God has made him a pastor and overseer over. It will be different. But you see the problem here. There are people that will see this because it says when they come to the dance in the worship of the Lord. This is religious. There are assemblies where there is dancing and drumming. There are assemblies where you have all these things of the world going on there. And of course, as they dance, it may be they dance to go and give their tithes and offering. It may be they dance because it is the end of the year Christmas party stroke, uh, Christmas carols. It may be they dance because it is a time of the church convention as well as camp meeting. They may have their reasons for dancing. It may be that it is the 60th birthday of their big pastor. That that is bringing them into a party, festivity and dancing. Whatever it is, that's of the world. Because it's uh, people like Herod that had birthday. We don't find Jesus Christ or Paul taking time away from missionary work and coming to do birthday. Neither do we find Peter or any of those apostles, or the people in the New Testament, even the ordinary members of the church in the New Testament, we don't find any of them doing birthday. So if you find, a, you know, a, a big pastor somewhere is doing birthday, or this one, and therefore there's dancing and all that, it's all of the world. And so then, as they're dancing and doing everything, you will see that they began to catch whichever they wanted. And it is not the will of God to do it that way. These are the problems confronting us. I say confronting us because, you see, unfortunately, our church members, they see other church members. And they see other church members that, well, in their own churches, there's no teaching. And our church members will say, oh, they are delaying us here. You have to pray before you can point at somebody here. In that other church, in that other church, well... Is, there's no use pointing to those other churches. That's not your church. This is where you are. This is a Bible church. That other church, there's no sanctification. Why are you pointing to them as an example? That other church, there's no discipline. Why are you pointing to that church as an example? This is the church you belong to where you have been saved. Or where you have been sanctified. Or where we are laboring over you. And if you want to get married, you will know that as we have helped you in salvation. Uh-uh. If we're able to preach and your name is in the book of life, 
You didn't know about heaven before until we showed you the path to heaven. You didn't know there was even a book of life until we showed you the book of life that is in heaven. And we were even able to preach the truth to make your name enter into that book of life. What did you know of the third personality in the, in the Trinity? You didn't know anything about him. We preachers and pastors are the people God used. And we introduced you to him and now it's your, it's your abiding guest. If we can introduce you to the Holy Ghost... If we can introduce you to salvation, if we can bring your name in the book of life by the grace of God, ah, is it marriage will not be able to help you in? We have helped you in other things. You have the passport to heaven in your hand already. By the grace of God, whatever remains, God will use it to do it for God will use us to do it for you in Jesus' name. And so we should understand that we counsel, we teach, we instruct, so that our people will not follow the problems of the wrong choice. In Ezekiel chapter 14, Ezekiel chapter 14, reading from verse 2, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of at all by them? Ezekiel did not know. You see, Ezekiel was a sanctuary man. Ezekiel was, uh, the way we'll say it today, a church man. All he knew is read the Bible and pray and be at the pulpit and maybe he make sure that he organizes everything is going on. The worship of God, he didn't know all the places that these children of Israel, where they had gone. He didn't know that they already had idols in their heart. Here we are in the church and we pastors, we are church people. But our people, our young men, our young women, they have been to offices. They have been to marketplaces. They have been to a lot of places. They have seen a lot of things. When they come to church, many of them already have idols in their hearts. And if we don't show them that they have to vomit all those idols, and they have to get rid of those idols, they will not be able to know the will of God in marriage. And so God told Ezekiel, he said, these people have set their idols in their hearts. And they are not in the best position for me to reveal my will unto them. And so we should make sure that we don't have any idol in our heart. Especially, we should make sure that we do not plan to marry an unbeliever. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Many of us, when we see the commandment of God, we say, why? Why? It's because of the love of God. You see, humanity has been here for almost 6,000 years. And God has watched the history of man from the Garden of Eden until this very time. Young man, God has dealt with young men like yourself for thousands of years. Young lady, God has dealt with young ladies like yourself for thousands of years. And God has watched. And he has seen, no exception, no exception. He has seen that marriage with the ungodly, marriage with the unrighteous, marriage with the unbelievers has always ruined every one of them without exception. And because of that, from experience of thousands of years, from the knowledge of God from all eternity, from the havoc, the evil that the unequal yoke has done to multitudes of people that will have been used of God in a mighty way, God now says, this is your own chance now. Your life is still fresh. The plan I have for you is still neat. Nothing is disturbing it. Nothing is touching it. If you cooperate with me, God is saying, you and God, you can be in the majority. And God can do wonderful things in your life. But there are people like you that I wanted to do good things, great things through them before. That is, before this time. But they ruined their lives because of this sin. And here you are now. And you are a candidate for mighty things in future. In fact, God looks at his plan. He says, you can't treat this and writing. 
you can't see this mystery but if you could read if you could see i have great plans for you but then you must make sure that you don't spoil this plan you don't spoil this plan what you can do to spoil the plan is what thousands have done and they have spoiled the plan be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers God will never take any good thing from a child of God. Sometimes if we have any disagreement with God, I think it is good. God says it is not good. Who is right? I think this thing will make me happy. God says it will not make me happy. Who is right? I think this thing will profit my life. But God says it is not going to profit my life. Who is right? You are just a man, a woman of yesterday. But God is the God of all eternity, the ancient of days. He knows what we don't know. He knows the thoughts. He knows the plans. He knows the, the hypocrisy of many people that we don't know. The people you think are good, God knows if they are not good. The people you think this will make it, God knows if they will not make it. He knows the end from the beginning. He can speak of future generations and thousands of years before they ever happen. And with all this knowledge, he brings his knowledge now at your disposal. He says, because of what I know and because of the good plan I have for you, that's one thing you must never do. This will never be good for any believer. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion has light with darkness? You see, our problems in discovering the perfect will of God in marriage arise from the deep problem that is within us. The problem is not outside. The problem is within us. One, there is ignorance of God's deep personal love for us as individuals. You see, if I don't know that God loves me, I wouldn't know he's going to be planning for my marriage. If I don't know that God loves me, I wouldn't know that God has a plan for me, the blueprint he has for me, I wouldn't discover that at all. And so, because of that ignorance, that's one of our problems. Not only that, number two, there's deep-seated unbelief. Disguising itself in various forms. Actually, you know, those uh, people that take a wrong step in marriage, if you really look at it at the foundation, it is because of a deep seated unbelief in God. I believe in God, but it is superficial. They are afraid God may disappoint them in marriage. They say they believe in God, but it is superficial. They are afraid God may be too late. They say they believe in God, but that is superficial. They are afraid God may choose somebody for them that is not beautiful enough. They say they believe in God, but they are afraid that God may not be wise enough to give them somebody that will match them. So they say, God, you don't worry about it. Let me use my eyes and let me scout around and look around. I will choose somebody, and when I bring it to oh God, you will see that I really am a master uh, person that I can choose. Well, it's because of unbelief deep-seated unbelief disguising itself in various forms number three our problem is walking by sight constantly judging things by the outward appearance constantly judging things by the outward appearance i'm, I'm sure that if uh, you know if god were to leave you to choose and here is a young aaron and here is a young moses in fact, they're even of the same parents. They're bearing the same surname. And then if God were to make you, were to say, okay, make a choice. Well, when you listen to Moses, when you listen to Aaron, you're likely to say, oh God, well, this one is simple. I know that there are some tests and exams that are very difficult, but this one is very simple. And God says, what is your answer? Which one do you choose? Which one is going to be better? That is going to have a master plan that is going to affect the whole world. You say, well, God, that is very obvious. Aaron is. And God says, you are wrong on the simplest test. You see, when you look at Moses, you're not going to think that this one is going to be able to make it. Now, if you look at Paul, and you see, when you read about Paul, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he, he writes about it. He said, the people said that his appearance is base. 
It's not something that is very, very attractive. And yet that is the man through whom the mysteries of the gospel of the kingdom of God came out very clearly as they wrote almost half of the New Testament. You see, if we, if we have unbelief, we're going to be walking by sight. We're going to be thinking that this one is not good enough, that one is not good enough. Now, uh, you see that this is very, very important that we, as we depend upon the Lord, we will not allow walking by sight and all these other various things to lead us astray. Problem number four, strong tendency towards self-management. You want to manage yourself. You want to take care of yourself. You want to be you are a secluded Christian. And you are all the time. You don't tell your plans to your coordinator, your region overseer, your state overseer, your national overseer. You are just a secretive, secluded person. Self-management. Even though you are calling Christ Lord, yet you are unwilling, unwilling secretly within you to submit to all is lordship or to submit everything under his lordship another problem we have got is impatience because of unwise comparison with others so and so has got married i must do it now so and so has got this i must do it now canal comparison unwise comparison forgetting that god's plan for each life is unique and unlike others number six emotional involvement and attachment that is so strong it overwhelms our spirit our will blindfolds us that we can no more see reality number seven worldly influence in literature in the practice of society making abnormal things look normal and proper you see as you look around and you see a lot of things that people do Things that are abnormal, they make it look like it is normal. And those things influence us negatively. Number eight, insincerity with God. Insincerity with ourselves. Many times we deceive ourselves, we delude ourselves, we fool ourselves. Insincerity with others. If you have a Christian father or a Christian mother, if you have a pastor, if you have a Christian teacher, if you have a person that brought you to know the Lord, and this brother or sister is so interested in your marriage, he'll be calling you, brother, I about this area, oh, no problem at all, no problem at all. You are insincere with yourself. You are insincere with other people. Let us be sincere with God, because it is only in that sincerity that God can really help us to know his will and to do his will. And we're insincere, we call good evil. And we call evil good. Number nine, familiarity and ungodly desire for the forbidden associations. There are associations that God has forbidden for a child of God. And because of the familiarity, it may be that you are walking in a place and you always walk with these some believers and by and by you get familiar. In that familiarity now, you begin to say things that you shouldn't be saying. You are an unbeliever. The only thing that, you know, makes you to do anything together is good morning, good morning, good afternoon, good afternoon. And if you are working in the office and there's any job that connects you, you do the work and that is all. Anything more than that will be you want to give him a tract. You want to give her a tract, not for yourself, to invite him to know the Lord, to invite her to know the Lord. And it is to make sure that this person comes to know the Lord. But when you begin to get personally interested in that unbeliever, that familiarity and ungodly desire for the forbidden association will eventually be a problem. Number 10, misplaced emphasis in life misplaced emphasis in life that all you see is just you want this you want this and everything is on marriage you are dreaming of marriage when you, before you sleep you are thinking of marriage while you are eating you are thinking of marriage while you are reading bible you are thinking of marriage you misplace your emphasis you shouldn't be thinking and daydreaming on just marriage and marriage and marriage alone there is nothing so good and so satisfying and so enduring and so fulfilling as god's perfect will in marriage there is nothing else to be compared with god's perfect will his perfect choice and his perfect timing 
His permissive will can in no way be compared with his perfect will. There are some people that will say, Lord, even if this is not your perfect will, since I say that I've seen it and I've chosen it, can you not give me your permissive will? The permissive will is going to get you into trouble. Now we've seen the wrong thing. Let's see the right choice. Steps towards the right choice. What steps are we going to take so that we can actually have the right choice in marriage? And we thank God because of the word of God. You see, the Lord has given us the word. And if you follow the word, even if you appear to be an ignorant fellow, you are not highly educated, you are not highly spiritual, all you have, all you have is that you have salvation, you are born again, you are not highly intelligent, you are not one of these people that know so much and have so much spirituality. Yours is just a moderate thing. Well, thank God, the verses that direct us as to what to do in marriage, the verses are not too many. That we will say that the verses are so many that I can't understand them. The verses are not written in so big grammar that I will say that, you see, I'm not intelligent enough. If I read all those things, I cannot fully understand. Thank God that the directives of the Lord in knowing the will of God, they are reaching in simple, simple, simple language. And the youngest of us, that is the youngest among those who are marriageable, the youngest of us can look at these verses and say, I understand that. That's a very simple thing. And by the grace of God, I can take that step. If I, if I have entrusted my soul into the hands of God, can't I entrust my marriage into the hands of God? If I've entrusted my future, my eternity into the hands of the Lord, uh -uh, can't I entrust my marriage into the hands of God? Let's look at Psalm 37 from verse 3. It says, trust in the Lord and do good. No big vocabulary there. Trust in the Lord and do good. And so shalt thou dwell in the land. And verily thou shalt be fed. Your part there is simple. Trust in the Lord, do good. The other part is for the Lord to fulfill. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. In verse 4, delight thyself also in the Lord. Who will say that is difficult? Delight thyself also in the Lord. That's your part. The other part belongs to the Lord. He shall give thee the desires of thine heart. You go to God as a child of God. And like a baby will talk with his baby language to the mother. Like a little son will talk uh, like, uh, you know, with his little vocabulary to his father. You go to your father and say, God, I want to have a happy marriage. That's legitimate. I want to have a kind of marriage that will make me to still keep in the way of righteousness. That's legitimate. I want to have a kind of marriage that I will know that my life will be fulfilled. That's legitimate. I want to have a kind of marriage that the union will make me a happy person, a satisfied person, a fulfilled person, somebody that will be faithful to me, and I'll be so glad to be faithful to the person. That's legitimate. And then God says, if that is all you want, I even have more for you. Because all that you have been describing, they're very, very simple things. And they're the very basic things I want to do for you. All I want you to do is trust in the Lord and do good. And delight thyself also in the Lord. What do you do to delight yourself in the Lord? Just delight in the word of God. Delight in the choir. Delight among the usher, in the ocean work. Delight in evangelism. Just delight in the things of God. And you know that when you delight yourself in the Lord, you know that the Lord is going to give you the desires of your heart. What it means is you delight in the work of God. You delight in the very fact that here am I, I am doing what God wants, and I say delight in that service of God, in that work of God, the rest is for God. He will give me the desires of my heart. Some people say, ah, sister, you're so busy with the choir. 
and you delight in this musical instrument and singing and ministration and all the time. Are you not afraid that if you are too consecrated to God like this, you delight in the Lord like this, don't you think that huh, marriage may not be possible? There is nothing like that. You delight yourself in the Lord. The Lord says he will give you the desires of your heart. And young man, here you are, you delight in evangelism, you delight in ushering works, you delight in the choir work, you delight in house fellowship, you delight in the work of God. Don't you think that this is a busy, busy thing? And don't you think that this delighting in God can... People don't like those who are so serious like this. Don't you think that you can be left out? Nothing like that. If God is going to be faithful... If God is more faithful than man, you delight yourself also in the Lord. And he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Verse 5, commit thy way unto the Lord. Anything difficult there? Any vocabulary that I cannot understand there? Commit thy way unto the Lord and trust also in him. That's my part. You know his part. He shall bring it to pass. You do your part faithfully. And these are simple things you do every day. You can delight in the Lord from morning till evening, and then by evening you go to sleep. You have your quiet time. You wake up in the morning again. You just say, Lord, it's another day. For these few hours of this day, I want to delight in the Lord. That's not too difficult. We can. We can delight in the Lord. We can commit our ways unto the Lord. That doesn't mean that I'm going to fast for seven days, talking about marriage for seven days. God is thinking about that. All he wants you to do is to delight yourself in the Lord. Commit your way unto the Lord. He shall bring it to pass. Look at verse 6. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness at the light. And thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord. Anxiety can destroy. Worry can destroy. Every time you come to the fellowship, oh God, remember me, oh God, remember me, I've not got married, I've not got married, rest, rest and relax. It's not like that. It's not something we grab and we quarrel about and we fight over and we, you know, put our fists together and knock on the table and say, God, if I don't get married this week, I don't know what will happen, rest, rest, rest. That worry and anxiety will give room to the devil. You see, when you are too much in a hurry, and you are not relaxing, and you are not resting, and you are too much agitated, the devil can bring something that will look like it should be what you want. Rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for him. Wait patiently for him. Wait patiently for him. Now, you know, Waiting sometimes can be difficult, but waiting can be very, very easy. You know, you think about this man, Saul. He was to wait for seven days, waiting for Samuel. But then he had waited, and unfortunately, the very seventh day, see a man who had waited for six days. And the very seventh day, he said, look, Samuel is not coming. And as Samuel is not coming, I'm going to do something. And he forced himself. In a few minutes, he had offered the sacrifice. Immediately, he finished. Samuel came. Samuel said, what have you done? Oh, he said, I've been waiting. Now, the one hour that he could have waited, everything could have been all right. Now, that one hour, if, Sam, if Saul was having difficulty waiting, you know what he could have done? He could have been reciting the Psalms. The Lord is my shepherd. When you are reciting something like that, you even forget that you are waiting. You get involved in the worship of God. You could have been doing some other things, not sacrificing, not that thing you shouldn't have done. You see, waiting is very easy. There are 24 hours in the day. And these 24 hours were not always awake. An average person is going to sleep for about six, seven, or eight hours. All during that time of sleep, there's no worry, there's no anxiety. When you wake up in the morning, it's easy to wait in the, in the Lord and upon the Lord. Make sure that you time yourself. You have to do your quiet time, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, or one hour. While you are reading the Bible, just enjoying the Lord. And there are cases there for you to listen to. 
Now some of these songs that these choir brethren are singing were put in cassette. You can listen to them. Not only that, you can go out with another person and go and evangelize. Then you go to your place of work. If you are a student, you go to the library and read. And then you have all these things that you are doing without knowing at all. If you plan your day very well, evening has come. You don't even know that you are waiting. It is when we are idle that waiting becomes very difficult. We wake up in the morning, no plan. We wake up in the morning, no timetable. We wake up in the morning, there's nothing this young man is doing. Because there's nothing he's doing, he's thinking, oh God, I've been waiting for marriage, I've been waiting for marriage. Fill your time and fill your life with things that are very good, that keeps you busy in a wonderful way, and you'll be waiting on the Lord. Once in a while, you just remind the Lord, because it says, put me in remembrance and plead your cause. So once in a while, you will pray and you will remind the Lord. And because you have been doing all these other things, trusting in the Lord, doing good, delighting thyself in the Lord, committing thy way unto the Lord, resting in the Lord, and waiting patiently for him, fret not thyself, because of him who prospereth in his way, or because of the man that bringeth wicked devices to pass, cease from anger, forsake wrath, fret not thyself in any wise. Then the Lord says, in verse 9, for the evil doers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. They will inherit the blessings of God. I pray that God will help every one of us. So that by the grace of God, as we do all these things, and you pray, the Lord will reveal his will unto every one of us in Jesus' name. To seek God to reveal his will in marriage, you must keep the will of God in that which is already revealed unto you. That's what you do while you are waiting. If God has said repent, make sure you already know that will of God and repent. If God has told you to destroy or call thick materials, do that. And if there is, uh, you know, breaking covenant with demons, break all those covenants. Separate from the old friends and sin partners. Do your restitution, cast off the unequal yoke with unbelievers. Because the Bible says, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. There is no room in God's will for a believer, I've told you before, to be united with a sinner. It is not enough to even say that he or she believes. What does he believe? Is he truly a believer? And how firmly does he believe what he says he believes? Marrying a so-called Christian of different conviction and doctrinal persuasion can be very dangerous and disastrous to your Christian life. God always gives his best to those who leave the choice to him. If we really want him to guide us in this matter of choosing a life partner, we should be flexible and yielded in his hand. That means we shouldn't say by force, this is the kind of person I want. Now I've told you there are general things we want. You as a Christian, you want to marry a Christian. That's legitimate. That's the word of God. You as a Christian, you want to marry a good Christian. But that word good must be according to the definition of Bible, not according to your own definition. You as a Christian, you want to marry a Christian that is going to be faithful to the Lord and faithful to the word of God and faithful to you. That's legitimate. But then there are things that are illegitimate. You don't say, well, I must marry from this particular tribe. I must marry in particular from my village. I must marry from the same language group. When you begin to go into those details, you are tying the hands of God. You are saying, God, I leave the choice to you. But God, take down these notes and make sure you don't forget. Because when you bring it back, I'm going to examine that thing you say is your will. Make sure it's the same language. Make sure it's the same tribe. Make sure it's the same village. Make sure it's tall. Make sure it's short. Make sure his riding car, make sure the color of his car is red, make sure that this, and make sure that this, and make sure that whatever I cook for him is going to eat. You know, when you put all that down, you get into problem. But just general description. You want a Christian, a faithful Christian, a Bible-believing Christian, a person that you and that individual will be able to live the Christian life together, and you will not suffer any loss in your Christian life. We want his will. 
not our own. To discover the perfect will of God involves a lot of patience. I've spoken about that. Waiting and praying and trusting in the Lord in his way at his own time. After praying to God, we must believe that he will definitely answer your prayer. Now, in a message like this of marriage, what some of us will expect that the preacher will say, which I'm not going to say, but which I know, but I'm going to tell you so that you don't think that I forgot that area. Because you are going to look at your notes later. Uh, you are going to say, he forgot something very important. He forgot to say that to know the will of God, you may have a vision. You may have a dream. You may have circumstances working together. You may have this. You may have that. That's what you wanted me to say. I said it, but I didn't want to say it. You see, we don't want to go into details of how do you know the will of God? Because, you know, God has a thousand and one ways of making us to know his will. And two different ways. You see, when God reveals his will, he knows your level. He knows how he can communicate with you. He knows how you will understand what he's revealing unto you. And sometimes, you know, there are people that will tell you that they had this dream, they had this dream, they had that dream. And after they have jumbled all these uh, dreams together, and they are, you say, okay, go ahead. And eventually, after three months, they come back and they say, it's no more the will of God again. And then you say, how about those dreams? Well, uh, it is true I had the dreams, but I misinterpreted the dreams. So we are not just waiting on dream. We are not just waiting on revelation. We are not just waiting on vision. And it is not compulsory that somebody must by force have a dream. Not everybody is going to have dream before he gets married. It is not compulsory that somebody must have a revelation. I mean, the kind of revelation that you talk about, the book of revelation. I saw the bears, I saw the angel, I saw this, I saw this. Not everybody is going to have that. It is not everybody that is going to have a vision. Like the vision of Isaiah in the year that King Uzziah died. This is the vision I saw. Not everybody is a prophet. Are all prophets? Are all apostles? Are all workers of miracles? Now let's add to it. Are all dreamers? No, not at all. Therefore, it is not everybody that is going to say, this is what I saw, this is what I saw. But God is faithful. God will make you to know who he wants you to get married to because he knows how to lead you in the way that he ought to lead you. Now, I'm going to give you some points. If somebody comes to you declaring himself, or ourselves to be the will of God for you in marriage. Here you are. You may be a sister. And a brother comes and he says, I have prayed. And as I prayed, I have known the will of God. And I see that you are the will of God. He may be right. He may be wrong. How do we know if he's right? How do we know if he's wrong? Or sometimes it may be the woman. Now, in the traditions in our various, uh, in our various uh, nations. The tradition is that it is always the man that goes to the woman saying, I want to marry you. But there's nothing that says that a child of God, that is a sister, if she is of age, cannot be spoken to by the Lord. The Lord can speak to the sister that he wants that sister to marry a particular man. Can she make mistakes? She can. Just like the men can make mistakes. So that's no big deal. So if it is the sister that knows the will of God, the sister will go to the pastor of that church and will tell the pastor, I have known the will of God. Who is the person? So and so. And the pastor will deal with that case just like the pastor will deal with it if a man had come. But then, so then, if it is a man that goes to a woman saying, I know the will of God to you, how does that woman test to know whether it is the will of God or not? If it is a woman that goes to a man, how does that man know whether it is the will of God or not? Here are the tests. In 1 John chapter 4, 
First John chapter 4, reading from verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets, false dreamers, and false visioners, and false, I know, I know, and they don't know anything, are gone into the world. Therefore, if anybody comes, how do you know that actually this is the will of God? Number one, it's his testimony according to scripture. All that he tells you, listen very patiently. And listen with a neutral mind. You are not rejecting, you are not accepting, you are neutral. You have nothing in your mind against him. You have nothing in your mind for him. Neutral. As you look at this testimony that he gives you, with neutral understanding like that, is it according to the scriptures? Read it on your own later. Isaiah chapter 8 verse 20. Number 2. Does he or she have a definite experience with the, with the Spirit's witness of being born again? Now you see, if somebody comes, you want to make sure this person is a believer. Therefore, one of the tests will be, does he have the witness of the Spirit of God that is born again? Do we know that this individual, can I tell? Is it convincing to me that this woman or this man is actually born again? So you are not getting your hand in marriage to an unbeliever. Number three, does the fruit of his life show that this branch is still attached to the vine? You see the fruit that they bear. As, because after all, maybe you are in the same church. Maybe you are in the same community. Or if you are not in the same community, you will know. You'll be able to tell the fruit eventually. Does the fruit of this person's life show that he is still a branch attached to the vine? Or perhaps this branch has been cut off and is withered spiritually. That's in John chapter 15 verses 5 and 6. Number 4. Do I have the Spirit's confirmation in my spirit? He has given me his testimony. I am a child of God. Whether I'm to accept or I'm to reject will depend on the confirmation of the Spirit of God in my own heart. It is not that, well, I've been waiting for a long time. This one has come. Well, let me go into it. He says he's a Christian. He says he's a member of our church. Do I have the witness of the Spirit, the confirmation of the Spirit that God has sent him to me? Has the Lord been walking on both sides of the ends of the line? As the Lord has been talking to him, as the Lord has been talking, has the Lord been talking to me as well? Number five, do you have the added confirmation of truly spiritual friends and God-fearing counselors? Because we are told in Proverbs chapter 15, Verses 22 to 24, the place of the confirmation of those counselors. After you say, well, I think I'm all right. I think that I see this is, this is good. Do you have the confirmation of truly spiritual friends, not carnal friends, spiritual friends, and God-fearing counselors? Number six, does the Spirit give a gentle, steady, clear release to go with him or to go with her you see there are times when you will feel okay i should accept but the very following day no i shouldn't accept following week i think it's okay the following week again maybe i'm making a mistake wait until there is a gentle steady clear release from the spirit of god that you should go with him or go with her number seven well, that other one is Acts chapter 11, verse 12. The Spirit bid me go. In number 7 now, does the agreement or the association with him or her make you love God's word more? Want to love to pray more? Does it enhance your spirituality? Since you said yes, since you said this will be the will of God, since that time, do you love God more? Since that time, are you able to pray more? 
Does the association with this individual, the yes answer that you have given, does it enhance your spirituality? In Jeremiah 23, verse 32, and Genesis 30, verse 27, number 8, is there a pure, unfeigned, unquenchable love for him or for her in your heart? Songs of Solomon, chapter 8, verses 6 and 7. You have said, well, this is the will of God, or this person has spoken to you. Have you seen then that since that time, that's the unconscionable love, unfeigned, unpretended love, pure love in your heart towards this individual that you have said yes to? Well, you love everybody as brother or sister, but is there a special kind of love that is different from the general love we're supposed to have towards everybody? And so when people come and they say that this is the will of God, you don't just say yes, you have to test the spirit to see whether they are of God or they are not of God. Point number three, courtship, engagement, and wedding. The courtship, engagement, and the wedding. First Corinthians chapter 14. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 14. Let all things be done decently and in order. Decently and in order. Courtship begins after parents' consent has been obtained. Now you will see that in this message, I uh, have missed out what some people would like to hear. And I'm doing that deliberately. The reason I do that is because we have a lot of nations represented. And what you do in a meeting like this with a lot of nations represented is that you give the unchanging, unchangeable principles on which marriage is based. You'll see when I was talking about um, I was talking about after knowing the will of God that the person needs to go and tell the pastor, you will see that I overlooked and I didn't mention what you know. I mentioned the other one, but I'm not going to mention this. So I'm deliberately doing that because I'm just giving you the basic necessities. Now you see in some ch small church, we have just about 20 people. And we don't need a marriage committee there. In some churches, we have just about 60 people. We don't need a marriage committee there. We just go to the pastor directly. The things that are the common denominator, the common factors, that's what I'm talking about. I don't talk about the things that are peculiar to this place and peculiar to that place. So that's why if you feel that some things are missed out because in your location, this is a process and this is what happens, I'm talking to the body that is general, that covers everything. The local things or the peculiar things will settle that locally. Now, courtship begins after parents' consent has been obtained. The courtship period is a period of preparation for the marriage. Getting to know each other at this stage is very, very important and it contributes to the development of responsible relationship. It begins the process of becoming involved. Begins the process of becoming involved in each other's lives in a pure and holy way. You get to know one another's background while developing confidence and trust towards each other. You see, some people think that the time of the courtship is only for us to get together and say, what are your parents going to ask me? What are your parents going to demand for? That's not it. It's a time when you develop responsible relationship, having confidence in one another and trust towards each other. Non-Christians set no godly standard for such a period, that is, for the period of courtship. But Christians, after knowing the will of God, they go into courtship with a sense of responsibility, with a sense of faithfulness, a sense of holiness and sincerity before the Lord. They learn how to pray 
during that time of courtship. They learn how to share. They learn how to plan. And they learn how to worship God in a God-honoring way. While in the process of getting to know one another, they should bear in mind that they are not yet married. Therefore, the scriptures do not allow them to engage in flirting or marital relationship. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, Marriage is honorable in all, keep it honorable, and keep the bed undefiled. But all mongers and adulterers, God will judge. So that means that you flee fornication. You mustn't be behind closed doors so that you don't get yourself into sin. God promises made to each other or good promises made to each other during that time of courtship are made before the Lord. You see, there are some, especially young men, during this time of courtship, they're so happy they are getting married and they'll promise heaven and earth. And they will, if the sister says, as we're looking into this uh, courtship, uh, you know, we are thinking of the date, but how are we going to settle this? Everything is settled. How about this? By the grace of God. How about this? God's will. How about this? By the grace of God. How about this other provision? The Lord is on the throne. But we should understand that the time of courtship is the time to sit together. It's the time to plan together. And you will make promises to one another in response to what the sister is saying with my knowledge of the Bible, with my desires in serving the Lord, with the picture I have about marriage, and with what I've been telling the Lord about my marriage, this is what I expect when I get into the marriage. And a brother in response will say, Praise the Lord for that. I believe that the Lord will help me to do it this way, this way, this way, this way. And the sister is happy that this thing is going to work. And the brother says also, with my knowledge of the Bible, with my picture and understanding of marriage, this is what I'm expecting. This, our coming together, will produce, will mean. And the sister says, oh, praise the Lord. I think that that is very good. Remember, those good promises you made to one another during that time of courtship, is made, they are made before the Lord. The Lord is there. Failure to abide by those promises and commitments and decisions after the marriage will amount to unfaithfulness to God and insincerity before God. And it's going to affect your spiritual growth, your joy, your relationship with God, and your relationship with one another. Here is where I now want to call attention to those who have married already and you are here. Maybe you married just this last year, or you married two years ago. But since you got married, all the things you discuss during the time of the courtship, you are not doing any of them. You don't pray together. You don't read the Bible together. You are not as gentle as you promised. All the things you said I will do, you didn't. Your junior brother that you say, well, that's all right. Immediately we get married. I'm going to tell him to go and find where to live. You have not done it. And your mother that you said will not live with you after you got married. Your mother has been there for more than one year or more than three months. And the things that the sister said, now my parents are saying, aren't you going to buy clothes for me? And I've told my parents that, well, he is a Christian. He's going to clothe me. He's going to do everything well. The parents said, we don't know about this man. You are the one that knows he's born again. We don't know born again. Therefore, let him buy a big box and fill it with clothes before the wedding. And the sister said, no, he has promised me. He's a child of God. He's my beloved brother. He will do well. And since that time, since the marriage, no anchorship. And the sister is still using all the clothes she got before she got married. We see them in the church. And we see them out there, how their clothes are getting shabby. 
and all the promises we made during that time of the courtship that the sister was defending you before her parents saying never mind she will do well never mind he will buy that for me never mind don't ask for that now don't ask for any balls don't ask for any clothes don't ask for anything i know that my beloved brother will do it our beloved brother has become unfaithful and all these things, we're going to read Bible together. Have we read one chapter together since we got married? We're going to pray together. Have we prayed together on our family problems since we got married? You see, when we get, before we get married, we promise heaven and earth. Oh yes, we will do this. We will do this. We will do this. But after the marriage, where are we? We should be faithful to God. We should be sincere before the Lord. So that all those promises... We don't just make them. Just because we're happy, we want to quickly get married. Courtship time is not only talking time. It is time to work. And work hard. And prepare adequately in settling down in one's family and home. You see, sometimes a young man wants to get married. I've known the will of God. He has no accommodation. He has no kitchen. He has no cooking utensils. He has nothing at all. Fork, spoon, knife, he has none. You see, how does he eat? He has a canteen nearby his house as a bachelor. When going to work, he branches there bread and beans. When coming back, he branches there rice and soup. And then Bible and his leaves. Big Bible he reads, but he doesn't have anything to cook with. And then now, he's going to get married. Happy. I've discovered the will of God. Have you discovered the market where they sell spawn? Where they sell the things to cook? Where they sell furniture? Are we not going to sit on chair when we get married? We're not, even if we don't have mattress, are we not going to, going to buy mats? Nothing. They are just saying, I'm going to get married, I'm going to get married. All the money they are preparing for, dowry, and also the wedding card. Once they pay for that, finish. Is that marriage? If we're going to get married, it's a responsible thing. And during that time of the courtship, we work and work hard and we prepare adequately so that you'll be able to settle down. Have you been thinking seriously on accommodation, on furniture, on cooking equipment? Laundry equipment, adequate clothing, and provision for wife and family. Preparation for maintaining moderate living standard in the family. Looking for money to pay dowry is not the greatest preparation a Christian man can make. There is much more to prepare and provide for. The brother should not secretly ask the sister to bring the money for dowry. You see, there are some brothers... They don't even have a sense of shame. There are some things that people who are shy, not Christians, people who are shy, there are some things you don't open your mouth to talk about. They are getting married. And they say, sister, your parents are asking for dowry. Hmm. This dowry matter, can you help me and bring money secretly so that I will use your money to pay your dowry? You have mouth to talk like that and you say you are a Christian. If you want to get married, you should prepare. And you should be able to pray if you don't have money to pay dowry. Are you going to have money to be able to close your children? And to be able to provide food? And to be able to provide other things? Marriage is a responsible life. And it has to be done in such a way. And so, no brother should secretly ask the sister to bring money for dowry. And you sister, no sister should secretly, and eh, don't let pastor know this one. And don't let eh, some people know this one. I will give you, you are destroying the marriage foundation. If he wants to get married, pray for him that God will help him to do what God expects him to do in the marriage. Was it Rebecca that gave money to the husband so that the dowry can be paid? So Rachel that gave money to the husband so that the dowry can be paid? Why are we twisting the Bible? When we want to get married, we forget all Bible standards. Not only that, if you cannot do the least duty, how would you provide clothes and food and other necessities? 
Now, engagement and payment of dowry is an open pledge to marry each other. The wedding and reception should be moderate. Moderate. Well, the wedding in the world, you see, they spend all the money they have. In fact, do you know that there are people that go to borrow the clothes they wear on the wedding day? And while they go to borrow it, you know, you, they have this, uh, you know, wonderful kind of uh, clothes and wonderful kind of reception. And you go there and say, wonderful, that this is marriage. And then after one, after about two days, the people who lent them the clothes on, uh, you know, high rate, they go to them and say, hi about the clothes because other people are going to borrow it also to wear and then they return everything. By the time you find them the following week, the clothes they are wearing, ah, you say, are these not the people that I saw in that wedding? Well, they have returned the clothes they borrowed. So what you see now is the reality. Why don't we have that reality and do the wedding? So that people will know that this is who we are. Rather than pretending and being like the people of the world. So then, let us make sure that we don't get into huge debts. So that after the marriage, we're trying to pay all that huge debt, struggling for a long time. They're not being able to take care of the family. Remember that marriage is more than feast, expensive gown and suit. Marriage is simply the recognition and the blessing upon two people, a brother and a sister. Your marriage is a lifetime commitment to one another in the Lord. Start right. Trust the Lord, and then you can joyfully face the future together with faith and hope and love. We've covered some ground. We've not been able to cover all grounds, but we'll cover some ground that has given us some foundation. I pray that we'll be able to stand by this foundation in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Those of us who have got married, how is your marriage? And those of us who have not married yet, you say you have known the will of God, how are you preparing? And those who have not known the will of God, how are you waiting patiently, trusting the Lord, believing that God will do the right thing in your life? We were teachers of the world.